in progress. In progress. <clears throat> My friends, welcome to episode four, which now from now on, we're going to make sure that we call it by the right terminology, which My is friends, welcome chapter four to episode four. I'm already making some newbie mistakes here as my playback is playing back into the microphone. So let me start that again. Welcome to chapter four of the Modern Mindset podcast. I'm here with my incredible co-host, Camille. My name is Mafuz Chaudhry, and I want to thank you all once again for tuning in to another episode. We've been receiving some incredible feedback. We've been getting a lot of viewerships, and we're just really excited more than anything else that we get an opportunity every single week to come back and dive into different areas of personal development and share some incredible stories with you. Camille, before I get into the boring housekeeping stuff that we always do need to talk about, I just wanted to check in. How are you doing, man? It's Sunday. We're we're starting a little bit later than usual. You got a beautiful tan going on. My my uh, YouTube viewers will really appreciate that. But how's it going? Uh, it's going great. And this isn't a tan. I'm just bashful. Um, I gotta say, I am uh, I'm excited and a little bit nervous. Granted that uh, we're doing it a bit later. I hope that I can keep up with you because you know you always bring out such beautiful insights. And I need to mash up with you. So I hope that even at this hour, I can manage. You are always on your A game, man. I'm never worried about whether or not you can manage. My friends, if you're listening from a streaming platform such as Spotify, Apple iTunes, or Amazon Music, I would love to ask you very kindly to go ahead and subscribe and leave us a review if that streaming platform does allow you to do so. I've seen a couple of... Uh, Beautiful ratings coming in from um, our iTunes account that got us really excited. And what I wanted to start doing, Camille, is every single episode, I'd love to take it as an opportunity to read some of the things that people sent to us. For those of you that have uh, spent some time leaving us a review on platforms like Apple iTunes, I'm going to make sure I check it every single week and I'm going to read every single review, one review at a time per episode to really make sure that your voice gets heard. And we love the feedback and what we want to do just to show some gratitude is bring that to the episode and give it with full energy. If you do want to leave us a review on those platforms, we'll go ahead and read it. If you don't want to leave a review publicly, but you do want to just have your, your words read, feel free to send us a direct message on our Instagram account. Our Instagram account is the, the Modern Mindset Podcast. The Modern Mindset Podcast on Instagram. Uh, you can follow us, send us a direct message, and we're going to make sure that we share your kind words on this platform. Starting with the very first one as we debut the review of the episode from none other than one of our friends, Jasmine, who's been a longtime listener. And by long time, I don't just mean the three episodes that you're hearing. She used to be uh, someone that was very actively participating in a lot of those clubhouse sessions that we used to do in real time. So she's a diehard OG fan that's been around for a very long time. And after listening to the very first episode, she instantly sent us a message. And I wanted to use this episode today to share that with you. Jasmine said, it was an amazing episode. I've listened to it twice. I'm excited for the second one. I'm so happy for you on this and can't wait to see where you both take this series. These conversations I've always thought about, but to hear them through the podcast, all I can say is, wow, feels good to hear that others think these things and are now openly being spoken about. I can definitely say your conversations provoke self-reflection and diving deep to evaluate my perspective on things. Thank you so much for those incredible words. Camille, how does that make you feel in the soul hearing something like that from conversations? I really appreciate it. I mean, it's very seldom that you get to hear people actually give an opinion about what you're doing, at least for me. So I'm very grateful. And, you know, this is just, I guess, uh, proof that we're on the right path, that people can benefit from this. And that's something that I've always felt. And to have that validated externally by other people does help. 
a lot and I just yeah I'm really grateful so thank you Jasmine fantastic and I frequently talk about how it's hard to find measurements and metrics sometimes when you're building yourself through personal development and a lot of that sometimes is tallied on to like keeping score and you try to figure out are you on the right track and it's always messages just like these that truly make me feel like it's a sign similar to like seeing your weight on the scale and knowing whether you're doing the right things or not. It's very, I'm very grateful. It really means a lot when I hear someone giving us feedback. This is just one in writing, but the amount of people that tell us in words, you know, when we meet them and they chat with us about an episode and a story that we shared, I think is incredibly valuable. So thank you so much, Jasmine. And for anyone else that even took a minute to give us some feedback about these episodes, as I say, episode after episode, your feedback is our oxygen, and I hope you continue feeding us for a very long time. I'm very excited about today's episode, Camille, because what we talked about in the last chapter is we went very heavily on the importance of taking action, right? And that chapter really allowed us to dissect the, the importance and the results that can only be attained if you're taking the things that you learn and you actually implement it and put it into action. One of the things that I frequently hear about, you know, you and I are introverts, and I, I think this might be worth addressing. Um, and I may, I may be wrong if I say, I think you're an introvert. You may need to correct me if I'm wrong there. But I think based on our learnings in life, by doing things on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes we get hit with this thing that reminds us that maybe we don't have enough energy per day to do the maximum amount of the things that we want to do. And it's a big slap in the face. Some people use terminologies like burnout. And sometimes that burnout is used to amplify their understanding of what that feeling is, which is the fact that they've overextended what their body's energy and maybe their mental energy would allow them to do. And now they, they got burnt out. And as a result of that, they've lost almost all their productivity. They lost their energy. And in some ways, they lost their motivation and drive to really get things done. And this is why I'm very excited to call this chapter Better Efficiencies. And as we unfold this chapter, I really want to do a good job in explaining our journey and how we've been able to really add the right type of efficiencies in our, in our life that allows us to be sustainable and do it for a long period of time and also to maximize the amount of things that we can do physically and mentally. So let me start with that, Camille. Like when, you, when you think about defining the word efficiencies, when, when, you use, when, when that word gets thrown around, I worry sometimes that maybe it's, it's, too, it's too much of a jargon especially with how different industries use the word efficiencies. What does efficiencies in the world of personal development mean to you? I would think that uh, the word efficiencies in this field actually would be ways to maximize the amount of progress you make with the least amount of suffering, i.e. so then you have, you have a certain threshold of necessary suffering. It can be discomfort if you don't want to use that word, that you put yourself out there in an uncomfortable uh, place and you don't want to go too far out where you can't reap the rewards because you damage yourself too much and you don't want to go um, not enough to the point where you're not challenging yourself because then it's not effective and you don't gain as much or possibly nothing from it. So I guess in the world of personal development, I would assume that or I would assert rather that Efficiencies would mean how do you find the the most amount of gain for the least amount of necessary suffering possible in a way that is sustainable and that can carry a f forward progress in the future. And I, I guess if I'm hard pressed to make a definition, I would say that would be it. Yeah, I, I think we're very close, man. For, you know, from a very baseline surface level, obvious yet forgotten statement every single one of us has 24 hours in a day. And when you look at people that are achieving extreme things, like to me, one of someone that I really respect in the level of hustle and work ethic that they have is Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart is always working on something. By the time one movie comes out, he's already promoting the next movie. By the time that movie comes out, he's on a TV show. He's got sitcoms, he's got stand up comedy. And on top of that, he's vlogging on YouTube. He's constantly active. And I've been wondering for a very long time, like if he has the same amount of time that we have, what is he doing with his time that maybe we're failing to do? 
And can we actually break that out and figure it out for a long period of time? The one thing that was a big realization for me over, over the last, I would say, eight to 10 years is the fact that without a shadow of a doubt, I know that every single person has their own range and different energy levels. And some of us have a lot of energy levels and some of us have little, but also some of us have things that are energy boosters and energy drainers. And the realization around energy booster and energy drainers are important because it's not the same for everyone. And it's also not always the most obvious thing in the world. Sometimes you would see almost like someone going to the gym being an energy drainer, right? It's like they're draining themselves. They're using their energy to lift weights. But in a, men in, in a very scientific, but also like a psych psychological way, you're actually giving yourself the boost to get your day going. And it actually makes you get more done. I find with my personal experience when I start the day off by going to the gym. Then you see things like, um, when you're sitting around a room and maybe just hanging around a bunch of people and you're just you're just not really doing a whole lot. You're not moving. You're just having a conversation. That's another great example of, for me, what I think is an energy booster. You know, it motivates me and it gets me pumped to get things done. And sometimes it also drains me depending on the logic of the conversation. So when you have that realization, what I'm excited about is for people to go out there and discover what those energy drainers and boosters are. And the more you start figuring it out, you can be a little bit smarter for how to jam pack your day filled with a good combinations of drainers and boosters. I think it's important to note that you shouldn't avoid drainers. Sometimes the drainers are necessities for things you want to get done, but you need to figure out how, how much of a balance you can have between the boosters and drainers to, to make the most out of your full day. And when I started realizing things like that, I really started restructuring my schedule and I restructure it in a way that allows me to figure out the things that I can do day to day that allows me to do it for a very long time. I actually see burnout as wisdom. And as much as people stray away and give you all the guidance in the world of how to stay away from burnout, I think it's worth getting that burnout feeling at least once in your life. And the reason I say that is when you experience burnout, for the first time, you got to feel that threshold, that wall that says, nope, you can't go further than this. And then you can start asking yourself, why not? Why can't I get out of this phase and why can't I move forward? And that starts opening up a different dialogue because now you start reconsidering what your day to day looks like. And I get really nerdy about this stuff because I, I get very, very statistical about where I'm spending my time. But then there's also that other component, which is you need to kind of know how to like, what is it that you can do in order to get better and push that threshold? And curious about this, like, I, I actually haven't quite come to a conclusion because I've been wondering, can that wall be pushed? Is it set in stone in your DNA that this is the furthest that you can go before you run out of gas? Or is there some ability like getting stronger mentally, getting stronger physically, getting, you know, eating better might give you more energy to get more done. I'm quite curious about whether or not you've experienced that in your life where you've been able to extend your area of burnout by doing certain things. And maybe you could share that with us. Yeah, I, I absolutely think that it's possible. And I think I've had a couple experiences in my life where I've actually proved myself that I could have more energy. Uh, I, I guess like to start out, like before I give those examples, I just, the general consensus between introverts versus extroverts, I think a lot of people misunderstand, right? Extroverts are not, people that hate being alone, although that can be a quality that they have. It just depends on the individual. It's just when someone is extroverted, it means that they gain energy from being with people. So that would be an energy booster where an introvert has, you know, like you said, uh, everyone has a little, like their own set energy. And for introverts, socializing does take away from that or doing small talk. Uh, introverts are more likely to converse in like in a deep or intellectual way. And sometimes even when they're socializing, if it's in that context, it'll actually energize them. So with introverts in particular, it is a little bit more challenging because a lot of the stuff we have to do in life is socializing and we are social creatures. Being an introvert doesn't mean that you don't want to be around people. You still would want to create that social contact is just you need to recharge so you need to find those ways to do it and the reason why i bring that up is i am heavily introverted and what i've noticed 
is that I used to be drained off even hanging out with my closest friends once upon a time. And I would need breaks for a couple of days if it was like hour long hangouts. And especially if there were uh, conversations where I was the main focus and they became about things that I wasn't interested in. Then it became even more taxing to me energy wise. So luckily just through repeat exposures, I was able to extend that energy. And even now I can do, I can do a lot more social contacts than I can, let's say, you know, a year ago or even two years ago. Actually, best example is COVID. I'm pretty sure most introverts were so energized that they were able to like go out and contact and like make contact with people. I found that the introverts I meet now with what's going on actually crave this social contact a lot more. And I, I can only imagine how difficult it is for extroverted people that they had to find, you know, all these communities and they had to somehow manage their energy levels that way because you know being alone as an extrovert must have been a, quite a huge challenge so the other good example is exercise you, you you don't have that much energy when you first start especially when you're doing cardio so let's say you're jogging and sure it is a lot to do with how your heart adapts and how your muscles adapt to the stress going on and that's where this whole, you know, uh, it, in science it's called like hormesis, which is like, it doesn't necessarily apply to this, but it does. Where you, where you put your body under a certain amount of stress, like a little bit, just enough to challenge it, and it has to adapt to it. And that's why there's certain, uh, you know, stuff like they say uh, the chemical in tomatoes is anti-cancerous, and actually it damages your cells a little bit. But it's enough that your body responds by increasing its detoxification or other systems. I don't know how that particular co uh, chemical works off the top of my head. But that's how your body adapts to these things. So it is absolutely possible to increase your energy levels in the certain fields you want to. And the best part is you could focus it. There's a saying out there that if you can do something once, you can do it better, right? And I get excited about that when I when I hear your examples. With even with the socializing side of the world, is like you socialize, you get burned out, but then you may socialize the next time, and maybe you're not, maybe you're pacing yourself, you're not interjecting as much, you're taking your time, you're you're maybe talking about things that interest you a bit more next time. Um, and you can change the dialogue and you can get better at it. And over time, you find that those conversations actually uh, can actually become so good that it starts boosting you in other areas of your life because you may be more attentive and you may be applying that wisdom in other areas. I think it's the same thing for everything, which is you start something and you slowly start building yourself up if you really see value of it bringing you closer to your goals. Unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of things that you realize it takes time to be able to achieve it. And also it takes consistent amount of work during that time to achieve it. And the best way to battle that is by doing it frequently enough to get better at it. I remember I had this first feeling of burnout in a very long time, which was when I started uh, joining the Clubhouse hype. You know, Clubhouse app came out. Everyone can jump in. They can all use audio format and have great conversations. And the app got so big that by the time I joined, there were people there with like 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 plus followers. And I was just starting at zero. So very quickly, I said, listen, I'm going to start going aggressive. I, I actually had this conversation with one of my team members where I said, I want us to book at least one session a day, every day for 30 days and keep doing that as long as we can, because it's very clear that there's a correlation that every time you do a session that you're going to get a certain amount of followers and over time that builds. And I got to tell you, day three, I had to stop. It was like a punch in the face from Mike Tyson. You know, like it was like I was knocked out and I had to have a very hard conversation with myself and say, you need to slow down and figure this out a bit better. And then I took a breath and I came back in and I slowly built myself up to that level where I actually now could do one a day every day if I wanted to. As a matter of fact, now I've actually become a lot more skillful in the way I operate in these rooms where I'm not the only one speaking. Sometimes there's other people speaking with me so I can pass it off to them. This podcast is a great example as well. You and I are on the session together. 
we're kind of like tossing the microphone virtually to each other. Like you say something, you toss it back to me, I say something. And that gives us a leverage to balance our energy levels. You know, our last three episodes were about an hour 45 each. And I can't imagine doing an hour 45 myself with me speaking for an hour 45 straight, three, like three episodes in a row, let alone every single week for a whole season. I think that would be a very, very, very unfortunate punch in the face as well. So I always think about skillfully, what can you do or what, what can you add on as a result of getting the maximum amount of efforts in your efficiency levels? And that's something I've been struggling with at the very beginning. I think when you start something new, I imagine like there might be someone that listened to our last episode and they got excited to take action about their goal. So it may not be our goal at all. It's something new, something they haven't touched and they're doing it for the first time. I'm curious if you agree with this. You know, for part of me thinks that the first thing they should do is really figure out what their threshold, aka the burnout level is, right? And figure out what that extreme is of what they can do and then slowly scale back and work their way through it. It's kind of like you hit a, a plateau, you scale back and then you break through that plateau and now you're in new levels that you never thought you could get into. So the first thing I think is figuring out the basics, right? And the figuring out the basics comes down to trying to do um, trying to do what you think is the right way to do it and doing it as aggressively as you can so that you've given your idea enough time to breathe. And then after you hit that threshold, you have an opportunity to evaluate where are you spending most of your time? And you can make tweaks based on that. Would you do that the same way if you had to start a new initiative from scratch and follow that pattern of doing as much as you can until you hit a wall. Is that how you'd approach it too? Cause I'm curious and I'm, I'm even thinking out loud here, which is fun, which is very fun to do. Cause I'm trying to figure out if I agree with what I'm saying as I'm saying it very, very slowly here. You know what I would actually, however, I don't think it works for all personality types. Like I, I think for most people and I say most people that it's better to start slow and be consistent with it. Uh, is and of course it depends on the goal but i am the person that likes to sprint <laughs> and then or like to maybe a better analogy would be i'd like to just jump into the water and then see if i could swim because that's where that has served me well the most and also because i know how my brain, my brain personality works i get really excited and i get really competitive with myself with the progress and when you go head first you only, you only start failing and you only start making mistakes. And then you get excited by the fact that you're making these mistakes, reflecting on them and, and asking yourself, how do I overcome this challenge? Like this is insurmountable. But then like slowly over time, you build up these skills that, you know, can be learned or you can just kind of experience and you're like, huh, I can't believe how natural this is to me. So it's, it's kind of interesting when it plays out that way. And for me, that's what motivates me going forward. And then once I hit a plateau, that's when the challenge for me comes. However, I, I think for most people, of course, like I agree with you, it, like the first step, the first step is always take action. And then from there, you do have to, you have to understand how much you're willing to do and how much you're willing to take. Um, I, I can't remember who said the quote, but I think it applies very well. A person with a why can sustain, can withstand any how, right? And depending on how much of what you want to do is important to you, then you can keep going. And that's not to say that you have to listen to yourself because you can push anything too far. And of course, we talk about extremes a lot and the balance it should always be noted that when we talk, we have to make generalizations and we have to jump to extremes to portray these examples. But I have to say, nonetheless, that there's always the ideal place is in the center is to be balanced. However, like jumping to that one extreme makes you really quickly understand what what is going on and it gives you that kind of information. And um, Carl Jung also said, the more you are to one extreme, the more likely you are to flip. And if that's the case, then we can argue that you're on one extreme, then you flip to the other side, and then you learn from there where you are where you are completely because you have both sides of the experience. So it, it's a little bit strange, but I would personally like let's say if I'm if I really wanted to, 
create like I want to pick up a new hobby. I would would actually like sp like sprint towards it and let's say I want to pick up singing. Like I, I really want to pick up singing. What I did in the past was I I took singing lessons once a week, but I would practice an hour a day when really my voice <laughs> would get sore after 10 minutes. And that's not a healthy way to go about it, but at least that's what kept me motivated for that. And then I learned that I had to scale it back. And, and like you said, like burnout, there is a kind of threshold that you learn about yourself from that information that you just want to take a break, like that you kind of need to take a break. It's, I think it's, it's very easy with a lot of physical stuff with mental stuff. It comes out in different ways. So, I, I also believe there's emotional like burnout too. Like, I mean, in the sense that um, you share too much about yourself or you talk too much about your emotions or you don't talk about them enough too. And then that manifests in different ways as well. And then I see that as potentially harmful. Man, you said so many interesting things there that are that are making me want to reflect on a few, few major areas here. Uh, one of them being specifically that I... I have to always point out that every single person has a different thing, different way and different methods and different things work with them because I, I sometimes worry being someone that gets on a microphone every week that the things that I say, it, it may almost be like their bottom line, like this is the only way to do it. And I have to step back constantly and being like, it's the way that works for me, but look for yourself. So let me give you what the opposite of what I've seen in the past done. And then I'll tell you what I do. So, because I want to push that other people say different extremes. Other people say the opposite of what you and I are suggesting, because I think you and I are on the same page of how we approached it in our lives. You know, there's a program that I, from a, a very well-respected group, I have to tell you, great friends, incredible what they do. And I've gone through their program. And one of the things that they're really good at is a big part of the program is to help you build habits. And their habits are built between this chart that they give you that you work through from day one to day, day 21. And the goal is to get from day one to day 21. And if you can do it, you move that to, the, to your habit tracker and then you start focusing on that habit. And you can assume that once you hit day 21, you probably have enough momentum to keep that habit going. If you fail on any days leading into day 21, you don't be hard on yourself. You simply erase it. You start over again until you get it right. And you just keep doing it over and over again until you get it right. They also suggest starting with something small and get those easy wins in first. And one of the things when I signed up the program, they were like, hey, why don't you just start with drinking two liters of water a day? You know, start with that. Just do that. You know, get used to the process. And part of their wisdom that I believe is that once you see it actually building a real habit, you're going to be more uh, excited to put it into motion for larger things. So they say start small, win those, and then slowly start, start uh, leveling up what your goals are so that you can bring, build incredible habits. And it's fascinating when you think about if you can build one in 21 days, within the end of the year, how many new habits you could have if you do it successfully every single time. So to me, that got very, very exciting. But what I found historically that I've done is a lot closer to you. I think about when I wrote my book and published it for the first time. One of the biggest hype that came around my book when I released it that people wanted to keep interviewing me about was when, was when I first came out and I said I wrote my first word right to publishing and getting a book on the shelf in 14 days. And it was mind blowing and people couldn't believe it because there's people out there that spend years writing one book and then finally get it up there. So I had a lot of people asking me, you can find a lot of my old podcast episodes when I was promoting the book with people asking me why, how, and is it possible? Am I lying? Like all these things keep coming up. But the, here's what I thought of back then. I didn't think about it strategically from a productivity or burnout standpoint. I just simply said, number one, I know this motivation of writing the book is not going to last. And I know that if I don't act on the hype that I have right now around this burning thing inside of me that's saying, write the damn book already. I know that if I hesitated even a week too long, I may change my mind because other priorities might have taken over. So I had to have that proper sit down and saying, now that I'm excited, I'm going to start typing. I don't even know how I'm going to approach it. I didn't even know how to get the book designed, what the correct formatting was. I didn't know what, what an ISBN thing is. Apparently, everybody in the book industry knows that. I said, I'm going to figure it out. I'm just going to focus on writing the story that I'm dying to tell. And I went ahead and did it. 
And within 14 days, as I started hitting challenges, you know, being in this incredible search era that we're in, I quickly pulled up Google quick search and found the solution to my challenge a single time. So by the end of day 14, I was ready. I had the book published, had a book launch a month later, and it was a very successful launch. And the book did very well and it's still doing very well. I have to say that as much as this is going to sound like a humble brag, I really want to get this point across because I feel like I'm not doing justice if I don't. I realized somewhere down the road that every single goal that I have, I just happen to move a lot faster than other people. And it used to frustrate me back then when I used to work with a team of people on these goals. Because I was like, I have eight things done, eight things done, and yet this person is on item number two. Or like, this event is coming up, I have this whole marketing plan, they haven't even designed the first banner. And I used to get frustrated because I'm like, why can't people keep up with that speed? But then I realized that what I was doing is more like what you're saying, while everyone else was doing was a lot more like that growth program I just talked about with the 21-day habit, which is starting small with the easy stuff and then moving into the harder stuff. There's an incredible book out there called Eat the Frog First. And what that statement means in that book is simply that the hardest part, the hardest task is the first thing that you want to tackle. And once you get that out of the way, you're able to get a lot of things done because things just get easier. It's like you've already used all your energy to go uphill. Now the rest of the path is going downhill. Some people are too busy going downhill. They're taking the easy stuff out of the way. And then by the time they got exhausted, they're dreading the uphill climb that they're having to do. So I think of it as that as my approach is the fact that I like moving fast on an idea or a motivation that I have. Because what that allows me to do is A, realize that this is what I want to do and I keep building. Or B, it realizes that this isn't what I want to do and I found that quick enough without wasting too much time investing in it. That to me has become a big part of my model. I also think, Camille, that burnout doesn't just happen instantly. I think you stay in the fire long enough to get burnt out. I feel like you don't listen to your body and you keep pushing. Like there will be a day where you're like, you know what? I'm kind of not feeling it. It's going to be a day where you're tired. There's going to be a day where you're not excited about it, but you keep pushing, pushing, pushing while you're in that territory and eventually you burn out. So I do think that you can feel those levels of tiredness and discomfort and take a step back and, and kind of work, you know, find a new door to get through that without having to burn out. And that's something that I've really been focusing on quite heavily over the last, what I would say, the last four years since the book release. And I've been able to replicate that over and over again with my other initiatives. Yeah, I mean, you brought up so many interesting points that make that like make me think about a lot of things that, um, that I've read and I've listened to from uh, like, you know, neuroscience uh, researchers as well, because there were, uh, there was a, a, like a couple of authors that, that do this kind of technique when they're when they write books is that they don't finish the book until they're 20 percent done there's the one after it and the reason why is that they keep that kind of uh momentum and that uh, you know the dopamine hit from when they finish the project and they keep moving forward so it doesn't st- prevent them from writing the next book and that can be a very helpful thing to implement in, like daily practice where if you're about to be done a certain goal, you can kind of leave it half finished. And that's why there's a lot of techniques too uh, that authors use as well. Best example, because they can write a sentence or they can write the hard part of the sentence and leave that unfinished. So when they're done for the day, they leave that. And then when they go on the next day, they're like, oh, I can easily finish this sentence. It's just like a couple words. And then from there, they just build that momentum. So there is... Uh, something to say about that that technique in particular it, it's funny that you bring up you know how you do it how you do it which is you know talking about tackling the most difficult challenge first and for me I I do that too a lot of times but what I found is uh, when I was in the military reserves one of the most helpful things is that they made you realize that when you wake up the first task is to make your bed if you have a bed Right. And the way it is, is because that is usually the first one of the day. And that small one can translate to other things. Now, I'm not saying you do this in a military base because making your bed is a huge challenge, actually. But the whole point is that you start your day off with like something small and doable that builds forward momentum. Okay, task number one is complete. Now, number two goes. And then you have this uh, momentum that you ride and that dopamine hit 
goals from morning to like afternoon with these tasks and they keep on building up and building up and then you're able to be like okay i have a lot more confidence to take on this next challenge and so there is something to be said and of course you have to explore whether or not you need that momentum or maybe even just reframing your mind so the tasks that you do are actual goals so then you can carry that momentum forward or if you do tackle the hardest part uh, or the hardest challenge of the task you're going to do first so then it becomes easier and maybe you can balance the two i think as well it's very interesting to think about when uh that technique you leaving some the hardest the easiest part unfinished it makes it very easy to continue on i'm not sure if you could apply it to every task but most of the tasks that you can you could definitely see something good with that and um, another thing that uh, you you mentioned as well was uh, you know the diligence versus burnout part, which which is a very difficult thing to come across because when do you start feeling out uh, burnt out? I, I can't say that I don't I agree completely with the fact that once you feel like eh, I don't feel like doing it, I think it's. I think it goes deeper than I think that maybe that is the first sign after all, but I don't think that's when burnout necessarily sets in. I think that there has to be more information as well. I think it's like there has to be like a kind of feeling of frustration or resentment before anything like that because the, you know, I'm not really feeling it today. Maybe that's uh, just from like something else. And I think burnout comes just from this overarching resentment and like fatigue. Not when maybe when it's consecutive days over time, then you can start really thinking, oh my god, this is burnout versus the natural resistance of the consistency that you're trying to maintain. Yeah, interesting enough, I still think we might be saying the same thing because mm-hmm. I think of the the burnout being the like when burnout is achieved. And I, I hate that achieved is even the word in that sentence because who wants to achieve that? But when it's achieved, you're at that moment where it's you're you're too far in the deep end. But I think you can you can feel when you're starting to head towards the deep end. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that is your body speaking to you. And you're right, it's not necessarily the one day that you're like, I don't feel like get doing it, because you can't necessarily say that's because you're burning out. It might be that there's something else on your mind. Maybe you had a bad day, maybe that day looks a little bit different from your typical day. But it's that feeling in, in, in your body that you start feeling. I like the fact that you use the word resentment because the resentment piece, it goes so much deeper, which is at that time, you start feeling areas of hating yourself and losing confidence. Like, why can't I do it while others can't? I'm such a loser. Or like, man, I can't believe that these people are consistent and I'm not. Or I give up on everything. I suck at commitment. Like, And the, and the worst part is, It doesn't just affect that single task or that goal that you're working on. It affects you in all areas of your life. You know, you're all of a sudden have this mood and this floating characteristic that's that's affecting you in other areas. You're not as efficient in your day job. You're not as efficient in um, you're not as social in your gatherings. You know, it's always in the back of your mind and it eats you up in many ways. I still believe that there is a part of you that can sense that is coming. You know, I feel like there's warning signs and those warning signs involve having to stop and listen to your body because I think there's many stages of burnout and each stage allows you to kind of feel different things. But at the very beginning, that lack of motivation or the feeling of not wanting to do it, that usually means that that hype that you got from motivation has left your system. Now you really got to trust that consistent plan that you created that 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 uh that that goal that you set into mind that determination that you have and making sure that you follow through with the things that you're going to say so this is where the discipline comes in play right this is where the discipline needs to carry you through but it also actually made me think about um the eisenhower box and i I don't know if you heard of that camille but the eisenhower box is quite popular these days and for anyone that's listening I do encourage you to take a second to look it up because it, the visual that will do a far better job explaining it because it's a it's a quadrant box. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to try in my best way to verbally explain to you what the Eisenhower box looks like, which is every single task that you have for the day that comes on your table that you need to get done. You can put it into one one of the four boxes. And the way that the four boxes are broken out is based on how important it is versus how urgent it is. And 
if it's if it's important and urgent, you do it right now. But if it's important and not urgent, you schedule a time to do it. If it's not important and urgent, you delegate it to someone else. And if it's not important and not urgent, you delete it. And I thought that was a great perspective on deciding which tasks to tackle on every single day. Because the reality is, sometimes we may be doing things we shouldn't be doing. You know, there's a huge difference between activity and productivity. You know, activity could be like, hey, I got to get, I got to grow my business. I'm going to spend all day cleaning up my office, cleaning up my desk so that I can focus. Although it may seem like you got closer to your business goal, you might be using that as an excuse to not get the other tasks done. So there, there's options where do it later. There's an option where you say, don't do it at all. But then there's also an option that says delegate. You know, so by being able to decide which box to put it into, it will in many ways help you dictate which ones to focus on first, which also kind of ties in with kind of eating that big frog and getting it out of the way because you've already stacked up the urgent things. But I'm really glad you talked you talked about that list of tasks, the to-do list. And this is something I'm such a big believer in, which is a lot of people think about that long-term win and what it takes to get there. And because it's long-term, sometimes it's hard to be excited day after day because you're not going to see that result for quite some time. And what I think about is not focusing on winning the year, but simply focusing on winning the day. And what winning the day could look like is getting up in the morning and building out a list of what you need to get done just today, your to-do list for the day. And using the Eisenhower box, you can quickly decide which ones you need to focus on right now, which ones not to do, which ones to do later, or which ones to delegate. Then you go right into it. Now, the important thing that I want to state is that your priority list is your priority. Some people throughout the day will try to make you get their priority done. And I've actually learned this in the agency life. You know, sometimes you get into a meeting with a client. The client has their objectives for why they're in that meeting. But I also go in with every single meeting with my objectives. And I don't end that meeting until my objectives got checked off. So even if the client says, hey, like, let's talk a little bit about these things that we need to discuss. I will always bring it back to saying, did I get my objectives met? And by the end of the call, by simply looking at that list, I need to know, I, I get to know if I achieved what I was trying to do that meeting for. So I get really excited about that with meetings. And I decided to bring that into my life, which is no matter what happens today, no matter who tries to take up my time, whether I accept or decline those invitations will come down to, will it allow me to get my task done or not? No matter what, I want to go to bed being able to complete that task. Not every day will you be able to complete every task because you're going to have a realization that some of these tasks may need to drag on to another day, but where are you able to work on it to its full capabilities for that day? By the end of the night, by simply being able to gauge, and there's something beautiful about scratching off or check marking those things off your to-do list, and you look at it, you can go to bed feeling good saying, I've achieved that, I, I, I won that day. I've achieved the tasks that I needed to do. I've achieved my goal for the day. And it actually gets you excited, similar to making your bed in the morning. It gets you excited to use that momentum for the next day to do it all over again. And once you're able to do that, what becomes really beautiful is that you don't even need to really wait to see if you got closer to your goal. Day after day, you're getting excited. You're getting, you're getting very, very pumped. That dopamine hit keeps coming in. And by the end of it, you're realizing that you got far closer to your goals than you could. The second thing, very quickly, is the fact that you can get better at how much you can get done in your task list task list as well. So I like the fact that what we started with was being able to get better at it. And now that we're talking about getting things done per day, I simply think there's an opportunity to build as we go every single day. Absolutely. And you know what, I what I was describing uh, the whole, you know, eat the frog, I think it was called eat the frog, right? First, eat the frog first. Sorry about that. But um, I didn't mean to nitpick. It was also just interesting that uh, I knew we were saying the same things at some points and I love, I just like your take on it too. So I'd like you to explain it more. Uh, but I, I do, I do find the to-do list helpful and harmful at the same time, because uh, depending on who the person you are and how you write the to-do list, some people can just overdo it. And then some people will use those to-do lists to kind as a way to kind of not necessarily punish themselves, but to kind of feel like they 
are absolutely tied to this and they're not able to forgive themselves too. So what I what I found for me is that the to-do lists work and they provide such good momentum. And especially when you can take a look at it at the end of the day and give yourself gratitude. And then that's when you practice gratitude to reaffirm that. That's when I feel like the most power comes from it because you get you know all the excitement, all the dopamine throughout the day. You build this momentum and then you, you challenge yourself more and more. And then you find... You know what, like my goal today was uh, like 10 minutes meditation and then you're like, oh, but I feel like doing 15 now, right? And, and then the habit can even build up from there, especially if you see the benefits too, then you're more inclined to do more of the things that can actually boost your energy. And then you're able to see these other things that don't necessarily help you. Now that you realize that, hey, I've completed all these tasks and I didn't waste like half an hour on YouTube watching cat videos. That actually was draining. Like I didn't realize that this was just eating my time. I think those are very uh, good metrics well, and uh, activities that you can implement to help you move forward in that. And, um, and so I, I do know of people that will find them very hard to adhere to, uh, like that in itself. And I, I think, like you said, we're talking about things that work for us and that we, we recognize that every person is their own individual. I think, though, we have to also, uh, we can't stress enough how important gratitude is uh, because, you know, completing those tasks, they're amazing. But on the days where you don't complete all of them, we also have to practice being kind to ourselves and actually reflecting. I think, I think you brought it up even earlier as well. Maybe that's good information. Why didn't you complete that task today? Was it was it because it was a bad day? Or is that task not important to you? Is that a delete or a remove? Or was that something that you didn't delegate that you could have? And it would have saved you so much more time to focus on the other tasks. I think it could be good information. And at the same time too, uh, for people like myself that are inclined to put a lot of pressure uh, and uh, kind of punish ourselves if we don't achieve every damn thing that we set ourselves to and not to the like to the standard that we want then you have to be you have to be able to approach this in a way that is kind and that is constructive and not in a way that is making yourself a slave to these tasks yeah and First and foremost, that gratitude piece, I'm such a big fan of, and I'm really glad you brought it up because every single day that I wake up, the first thing I do is I write down three things that I'm grateful of and I'm grateful for. And sometimes they're very, very small. You know, sometimes they're, they're about being able to uh, get up in the morning and get things done, being able to have the freedom to do that, being able to pay my bill and have extra money left over. Like those type of things are items that you're not necessarily paying attention to, but are happening every single day, right? There's that odd time where someone will hold the door open for you or maybe even pay for your coffee. You know, things happen every single day that sometimes we don't pay attention to. And I like that we're using words like reflection and metrics and data, because what we're talking about is being intentional, right? Doing things intentionally, collecting and writing it down, and then being able to make adjustments. Because if you don't have that data, are you really making the right adjustments? Right? Are you really making adjustments based on the fact that you recognize that there's something that's off or there's a flaw in your system? Or are you just making it based on a gut feeling, which you could have been way wrong, or you might have actually thrown off the flow of the structure that you've built over the week? Like, I really, really geeked out over this earlier this year because I started getting very obsessed with trying to figure out where my productivity goes. You know, a big part of this was for doing some research as I'm preparing the launch of our productivity journal. I wanted to kind of figure out like, what does my chart look like? And I've downloaded an app called Toggle. Uh, It's T-O-G-G-L for anyone that's interested. I believe the app was actually made for business project management. Um, And what they would do is they would use it to track how much time they spend on meetings, how much time on the road, how much time on actual like internal meetings, sales and so forth. I thought, how cool would it be if I use that same tracking device for my own personal life and my day activities. And I sat down with the app on the first day and I wrote out uh, a few pillars of my life that were important to me. And that's where I started. I said, what is the most important pillars to me? 
you know, one of them was I had to uh, accept the fact that a big, big percentage of my time goes into the agency because we have an hours of operation. So that needed to be in there. But I also made sure I left open a pillar that was all about my own personal brand and my goals. Then I left a pillar open about relationships with significant other or friends or family, making sure that was also taken care of. Then another one for wellness, which is my diet, my journaling, my meditation, my exercise and all that good stuff as well. Then there was some other few additional things that I kept building up on, but it got really fun when I started tracking because I started tracking day after day. And what I started doing each day is I would evaluate at the end of the day, how I believe I felt, how I felt at the end of the day. And I had to gauge my feelings and think about it. Like, did I feel good today? Did I not feel good today? And, and sometimes it may not be the best accurate way of measuring, but you can start seeing a relative consistency when you start doing it for a long period of time that, hey, for some reason, like I started having a really bad streak here. I wonder why, you know, I, and then like I felt really good this week and I wonder why. And sometimes you don't know. And this is a, a, a good case to be made because, you know, we know that you're supposed to be sleeping eight hours a day. You know, that's the that's the guideline, which means 33 percent of your day should be spent on sleeping. Do you really know if you're sleeping enough? You know, if you had to take the average of your entire month, do you actually know if you're sleeping or if you're oversleeping or undersleeping? I believe it's the same to be true for people that are called workaholics. Do you actually know if they're overworking or underworking or does it just feel like that because of the fact that they're not spending time socializing? So I'm very, very intrigued by these stats. And what got really, really fun, Camille, is when I got to see a week where I didn't feel great, I got to put it side by side with the week that I felt great. And I actually was able to see where the chart started getting modified. I started seeing that I wasn't spending enough time on my wellness. You know, I wasn't spending enough time on my relationship. I was spending too much time even driving. Like, that's something I tracked. It was interesting realizing that driving was actually stressing me out because of the energy focus that's needed and the time that's being wasted while I'm on the road. So you start realizing a lot of things when you have data. And when you have data and you start comparing it based on whatever your goal is. So I chose happiness, but sometimes I choose like, did I get closer to my goal or not? Did I meet my, my task list or not? So whatever your task list or your goal can be a variable, but now you have measurements to de determine and dictate whether or not you have that goal. I believe that by having that type of measurement, I'd be very, very curious if someone else can actually look at that as well and start figuring themselves out. I think first and foremost, they're going to realize if you had universal data, I think first and foremost, you're going to realize that everyone has different time spent. But wouldn't you be curious to know, like, how is, what does Elon Musk's chart look like? Right? Like, wouldn't you be curious to know how these big, the guys that you're really seeing achieving great things are doing what they spend their time like? I'm very curious about that. Like I'd pay good money to get that type of data. But the beautiful thing is you can get your own data. And maybe if you're doing it with a group of efficient people, you can actually start sharing data and helping each other out by recalibrating. But I've really geeked out on that stuff this year, Camille. I think that's been one of my biggest wake up calls in how to take control and become more intentional with my time. I think it's a very methodical and interesting way to look at it too. And especially that you have raw data that you can't necessarily uh, cheat unless you really try, then you can actually like compare uh, like how, what's going on exactly with how you're spending your time. The, uh, the one th reason why I don't necessarily uh, use any, any kind of app like that is I always wonder about the quality as well. Now, not to say that, you know, that, that those apps don't track that as well and of course you you write notes and you know the quality of what you do and you're very intentional about your work so i know it doesn't apply to you i feel like a lot of people for for instance you know what myself included i i slept i have a very strict sleep st schedule i say that now as last night i went to bed at midnight but um usually i aim for eight to ten hours if i can get ten amazing doesn't happen because my body doesn't let me, but that's a different story. But the whole point was I didn't realize until a month ago that I actually have something called upper airway resistance syndrome, which is like sleep. It's not sleep apnea just because of the number of events. But what I realized is that my sleep quality is poor and I had to get that treated. And luckily since then, I can actually speak 
a lot better and I have a lot more injury throughout the day. And, and that's something that I feel like we should address as well because we're talking about efficiency is that quality, right? How can we put our attention in what we want to do intentionally with the best amount of quality and make it as efficient so it doesn't drain us as well? What you brought up is a very important aspect, which is being very particular about where you spend your time and understanding and realizing how it's affecting you. And I think the next thing that uh, that should be addressed is the quality, because I think one of the first symptoms of burning out is a is a decrease in performance, actually, um, and being completely like maybe not completely, but being out of what you're doing. I mean that in the sense of you're not focused on what you need to be focused on. And another thing, if you want to progress forward and be more efficient in what you do, is you got to learn how to prevent burnout. Because, you know, if you do a little bit of progress every day, it's better than doing a lot of progress and then not doing anything at all for a long time. So I think it's a very interesting thing uh, that you that you brought up. The, the apps, I... I really admire what you do with that, and I want to adopt that one day. I just, I need a more stable fl- uh, schedule, but I would love to compare, like, you know, how much time I spend versus someone like Elon Musk, because, man, that would be super interesting. Yeah, and, you know, I almost feel like people that are in the world of being life coaches or helping others with productivity should... Uh, should at least try this method, which is like if they had their clients really come back with the schedule, you know, it's kind of like a a dietitian, right? Like they'll be like, hey, eat what you normally eat and come back and show me and I can tell you what to fix. Right. But I what I where I worry that that may head the industry is that they're going to come back and tell you that you need to subscribe with what they believe is the right way to spend your time, which I don't think which goes against everything I believe in. But I do think that the metrics could help And, and not necessarily to convert the client's metrics to what you believe is right, but convert the client's metrics so that you have a, you have data to go back to week after week and saying, okay, you tried this now, how did it work? You tried this now, how did it work? And you can get very, very technical with it. You know, I just find it very difficult to believe that someone would, would not be able to benefit from knowing they're not sleeping enough or someone would not be able to benefit from, you know, if they're wondering like, Hey, why am I uh, all of a sudden not being invited to parties? And then they realize that their, their time used to be like, like, 30% of a week with spending time with friends now dropped to 5%. And surprise, surprise, maybe it's because I'm not doing my part. I got to pick up the phone and call more people, right? It's those realizations that I think get really fascinating. And in many ways, when I think about personal development and personal discovery, I, I like these stats more to learn about myself and where I'm spending time rather than like getting very technical with it because I've never really been a big analytical guy to begin with. This was actually, it took me a while to get into the habit. I've missed many days where I had to go back and like guess until I found out my rhythm to do it. So to be fair, it's not an easy thing to get into right away. It is something that takes practice, but I think it's worth getting to know how you operate so that you can make calibrate recalibrations if needed. And you could try new things enough to come back and saying, did it work better? Because if you don't get intentional about how to change things, you're really just trusting the world to kind of fall things in place for you and give you the greatest alignment. Um, And that's, I believe, what they call luck, right? You got lucky that a good day happened. I would rather just create my own luck, right? And creating your own luck simply comes down to the fact that you dictate what, what your definition of a good day is, and you're able to do that as a result of that. So I'm, I'm quite interested in that. So I'm, I'm curious to play this quick game with you, Camille. Sure. Being that you haven't tracked your time in the past, if you had to break out percentages of how you're spending, let's say a week, because a day would be too tough because days vary quite heavily. It's too vo- volatile. Let's say a week. What is your percentage breakdown of like key areas of your life? Like where would you say, and I'm, I'm talking like, pillars, right? Like, like wellness is one, like relationships is one and, and so forth. Like talk to me a little bit about the breakdown of what that would look like. Okay. So let's get the, the 33% out of the way, which is sleep. So that leaves us with 67 and let's hope my math skills are (laughs) going to work out because I don't think they are. Um, I would say, okay. So I, I exercise 
on average about um, let's see, one and a half times five is okay. Six. Okay, let's say seven hours a week. So one hour a day uh, on average, and then plus physio. So that would be okay. Then that becomes about ten hours a week, and um, and then how do I translate that into percent at this point? Oh my god, I'm already struggling. So let's let's do one and a half a day. So that would be again math terrible but um you know what maybe i should pull out a calculator okay let's just say 15 percent of it is exercise. i'm trying to help I, I have a calculator. <laughs> i'm trying to figure this out too okay so wait wait so 33 percent on sleep yes 33 okay. percent on sleep take a wild guess and it, it won't be perfect but a uh, wild guess but i'll tell you how much percentage you have left every time sure um take a wild guess of what you think uh you spend on that on that wellness side of your okay so wellness would include nutrition um and so that would include eating and uh, i eat a lot uh so okay and also the self-help and meditations and the and the working on myself my yep. goodness this is let's, where it gets tough let's let's take out the working on yourself mm -hmm. and put it as its own personal sure. development piece um, because it'll help to understand like this is what you spend on personal development versus like the routines that you have. Um, so that part, so meditation, nutrition, working out, exercise, physio, like those that part of your wellness, what would you stack on as an estimate of your percentage per week? Okay. That would be, has to be 20%, at least 20%. Okay. So we'll, we'll do 20 there. Um, okay. So you have forty six percent left. Forty six percent. Okay. Um, what else? What else is there? Social, right? Yeah, like spending time mm -hmm. with other people. Spending so that time includes, with other people. that includes family, that includes friends, and that includes if you're if you're either in a relationship with someone or you're seeing someone. Okay. Fifteen percent. Fifteen. Okay. Um, oh God. So, so, so like it's it's it gets kind of interesting because you already start to realize like the estimates may not be correct, right? Yes. And that part of your brain is kind of like working now trying to figure out, okay, so you have thirty one percent left. What do you think that thirty one percent is spent? Oh my god. We still have um well like I'm currently studying for a board exam and that's like a lot of my day. And then also I cook a lot. And I still play guitar. So where I messed up these percentages for sure. But yeah. um, majority of my day or a great part of my day is spent on studying. So that has to be at least 25%, I would say. Right, right. And that, that would then, at that moment, you are left with 6%. Yeah, 6%. Hmm. 6% would be, oh my God. Okay, maybe 5% is actually like cooking and then one the oh no but there's still all the self-improvement stuff oh my goodness yeah i We're think you definitely, <laughs> I, I definitely think you spent a lot more than one percent on it yeah. you know i'd be curious camille and if you're up for the challenge i'd be curious for you to track from episode four to five and tell me how close you came to what we just said because we have a playback of this so the beautiful <laughs> you can always go back and listen to what you said right and i'd be curious right i'm actually curious and what's good what would be interesting is what shocked you that was so different from what you thought, right? Because I think there's a lot of value there for people to kind of think about like, hey, am I spending as much time as I thought I was spending on it, right? When you think about efficiencies, it's like, are you spending enough time on the tasks that you thought you should be spending? We talked about this previously with that Kobe Bryant concept, right? The, the fact that you can't self-sabotage yourself. You have a plan, you go in and you complete that plan. But when you talk about quality, it's not just about did you do the plan or not. Is did you spend as much time on that plan as you said you were going to spend? Right. It's not like it's not like did you go to the gym and leave, but did you spend the full hour in the gym that you said you're going to do? So that part is where it's worth thinking about because you're not actually delivering on your plan if you are not doing what you said you're going to do. You know, going back to my book example, I completed it in 14 days. I spend five hours a day religiously. I know five hours specifically because my, my habit, fortunately, the world was open back then. So right after work, I would go to a local lounge. I would start at 5 p.m. and I would not stop until 10 p.m. I'd go five hours straight. And I did that every single day for 14 days, which is why I was able to get it out. 
you know, if you do, while well, I have my calculator out here, right? If you do um, five times 14 days, I spent a total of 70 hours, right? 70 hours. Now, if you think about an author that spends maybe three hours a week, right? Like some of them spend three to five hours a week on their book, which five actually is very extensive. So if I divided that by three a week, it would take you 23 weeks to get that book done. In other words, it would take you almost six months to complete the book that I was able to complete in 14 days. It's mathematics. And I really think that's what it is, is when you figure out the efficiency and you can push that throttle, what you're simply able to do by launching things quickly is the fact that you've been able to put in those committed hours while some people are navigating. You know, they're looking for that opening to decide if now is a good day to write that book and, you know, replace write that book with anything, whatever task that you're focusing on. Are you falling into that trap? Are you looking for that sunny day? And by sunny day, I mean like everything lined up that you have time to get it done. Are you letting that dictate whether or not the task is complete? And I think this is worth being intentional about. So wait, I need, I need you to first verbally tell me if you're, if you're interested in accepting this challenge, because I'm curious. But um, after that, feel free to share your thoughts about what I just said. But I, let me know about the challenge first. Okay, so the app is called Toggle, right? The one that that's you correct. And yes. it's worth saying, it's worth saying we have not been sponsored by this app <laughs> because uh, we would like to, you know, if they, if they reach out, I am interested. I mean, there are about efficiency, so I'm a fan of that, but I'm, I'm no way affi affiliated with them, but the good news is it's a free app. You get some extra features if you pay, but the free app will let you do everything we talked about. So I think it's worth trying it out for that reason. Okay. Well, yes, I accept the challenge because I have it downloaded and I know that with this playback, I am probably going to embarrass myself. But yeah, okay, I I am going to try it. And you're you're absolutely right. The fact that you were able to write a book again in 14 days, where if someone deliberately managed their time to fit it in their schedule, like like you described, I forgot two hours a day. You said yes, two hours a day. It would take them six months. Yeah, wait when you compare it like that it is absolutely amazing and you're right you're very efficient in that way that you're able to hyper focus on that and complete it uh i i find for me personally that i would do something similar and it depends on the projects i have because i have a personality type where i have a lot of unfinished projects and i used to punish myself for it and i used to be ashamed of it but I recently heard someone uh, tell someone describe it as a positive, and it was a very interesting way that he described it because essentially he said that, you know, the projects that need to be finished are finished, and the ones that are unfinished are always in the back and they're waiting to be finished, but when they're needed, they'll come and be done. And the reason why that's a good thing is that all these unfinished projects that I have, eventually they're going to get done. And if someone needs them to be done, then it's like, oh yeah, I have one half finished in my back pocket here. Let me just quickly bring it up and be done with it. So then for me, that is an efficient way of doing it. And in the same regards of how you're able to like, you know, amazingly write that book in 14 days, which is a great book, by the way, everyone should read it. Project reinvention. Um, then you got a, you got a, a great method, at least because it works for me. And I, I assume it works for a lot of people. And especially a lot of people don't recognize that that is actually another way to do things instead of the typical devote half an hour a day and then eventually be done. A lot of people are not built that way, myself included. And I'm pretty sure me even describing what that person said about these unfinished projects would be the first time anyone's heard of a, a strategy be a strategy like that being turned into a positive because mainly it's being shunned as you know that you're not you're not able to commit or that you're not able to finish these projects and i think since what works for me is also doing those uh those kind of sprints and then hyper focusing on that one thing does allow for for, I guess, more efficiency for people like you and I. And 
And um, I wonder if you ha ever had the problem where you had to overcome perfectionism in that regard. Because the one roadblock that I had and the one that I uh, struggle with and that I work on a lot is the perfectionism. And that's what leads to that roadblock of me uh, completing tasks sometimes because I'm like, okay, I'm hyper-focused here. I'm improving. I see the progress. I feel the progress. I get excited. And then the work becomes, oh, it's not good enough. Um, and I need to do better and I need to keep doing better. And I think that that can be a roadblock to being efficient and effective with your work. There was a video that I came across and I, I'm going to say that I haven't fact checked this, but regardless of whether I fact checked it or not, there's a, there's, there's a lot of wisdom in what was said, which is if you just spent your day creating a task list and you got to even 40% of those tasks that's done, you're doing more than 90% of our country. Because majority of the people are actually not getting their specific tasks done for the day. They're either doing someone else's task list. Task list, like if they're in a job, they're doing what they need to do so that the people at the top are making that money and they're achieving their goals. Or they're doing the things that are just that, that are habitual, right? Like they're, they go home and they cook food because they want to make sure the family has something to eat. Like a lot of people on that autopilot mode, all of a sudden they look back and they realize that, I, did I get enough things done or not? And as a result of that, they get upset. So on that perfectionist conversation that we are having right now, I think it's important to note that I don't actually use perfectionist uh, perfection as a metric or in any ways a, a, uh, a goal that I'm striving for. I think I mentioned this in the last chapter as well, where I said that I just want to get 1% better every time. Right. And if you think about it, if you're getting 1% better every time and, you know, I, I even like the fact that I say one because I'm I'm under I'm under promising and over delivering. If I do more than one percent, you know, the reality is uh, when you when you increase and get better, it's very rare that you're only increasing the throttle by one percent. You know, it might even be five to ten percent sometimes. But that's a good metric to chase. Right. In the, the perfection. First of all, what is the definition of perfection? Right. Majority of the things that you put out there in the world, especially in this generation, is very much subjective. So even perfection is just what's perfect to you and you may fall short. So I'm not hard on myself ever for the fact that something might not be great. You know, as a matter of fact, I found out after I published that book that uh, when I reread it many years later, because I, I decided not to read it right away, I unplugged and reread it about two years later. And I saw that there was actually a couple typos that my, my, uh, my uh, proofreader missed. And I wasn't hard on myself. You know why? Because I also have hundreds of emails of people that said that their life got impacted. And I think about if I didn't publish that book because of that error, or let's say I pulled it off the shelf because I was embarrassed by the error, how what the trade-off would have been. And that would be ludicrous to think about that, that trade-off. So I think about impact over perfection, right? And I think that if it's making the impact to me, that's enough as long as I'm focusing on gradual improvement, which is that 1% every single time, which allows me to make either better, bigger impact or better impact, right? And that's kind of where my focus goes towards in every area of my life. The other thing that I also wanted to um, emphasize here also is that, that story that you just shared about unfinished projects. First of all, beautiful perspective. I, I think it's it really speaks true to the fact that you really can't subscribe to one person's way of thinking because by doing that, you're accepting that their life that they lived was that perfect life, right? Because the, the reflections and the outcomes came out of that life that they lived. So in many ways, you're falling short being closed-minded by this is the only way to think. So the fact that there's another person coming in and throwing a contradictory, I get excited by that because it's going to now make me reflect back on why that was said and maybe change my belief if I really get through to that, that thought process. So there's a lot there. The other thing that I really like is what is the definition of something being successful? Sometimes it's completion. But what if completion wasn't the definition of success, right? For example, what if the goal wasn't to complete that project, but the goal was to take enough away, maybe, method maybe the different methods of how you put that project together or the couple learnings that you could apply to your next projects, as we call it stepping stones. What if it was simply supposed to be the stepping stone to your next big project? What if that learning was going to allow you to have better conversations and build relationships with people you couldn't have if you didn't dabble on that, on that project for a little bit? 
I think there's other areas of what success could look like. And it's not always completion. I think we're trained too hard on completion being the metric. You know, you think about what deadlines look like. Deadlines means you got to get that completed project or the completed test in um, by this time or else you failed. And that's a clear metric. And then you get graded on quality after, but that's also subjective and different things we could talk about. But the idea is that we've been trained to think that completion is what success is. I don't necessarily feel that's the case. In fact, I don't even call it commitment issues. I think that in many areas, sometimes sometimes you're not meant to have a lifelong journey with that project. Sometimes you're not meant to have a lifelong journey with that experience. Sometimes you're supposed to travel with it for a little bit of time, you know, like relationships you have in life that are no longer real relationships anymore. And that could be with friends as well. Sometimes they were in your life to arm you for the next big thing. And I think that sometimes that gets overlooked because we see the fact that there's separation now being a, considered a failure in that relationship. I right now credit a lot of my happiness in my relationships because of the bad relationships I had. And I don't even call them bad anymore because bad means that I, I almost have regret. The truth, the truth is that it wasn't great feelings. I wasn't excited about where it was going, but there was a lot of benefits that came out of it that allowed me to be the person I am to sustain the relationships I have today. So I throw perfection and completion out the door. I think completion has opportunities, but even if I completed four out of the 10 projects that I work on, I feel very, very happy because there's a reason those were the four that I focus on completing and not the others. Once again, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. Yes, I think, I think there is. And you explained it beautifully as well. I think, was it Warren Buffett that said that like in his, um, in his life, his investments, only two out of 10 worked. And those two that worked were the ones he made the most money off of. And that's how he made his, uh, his billions. Like, I think it's, it's amazing to think once you separate the, uh, the outcome of, uh, of success or the, what, what I should say, when you stop measuring success as completion and rather with the takeaways and the progress and the progress you made from that and how, how you can compare yourself to who you were before and who you are now. I think that is where the exciting part lies because then you know, you get a better sense of who you are in this momentum that you have and you can carry through that confidence and the skills you gained through those lessons. And I think you explained it like beautifully. And on top of that too, we talk, uh, you talked about um, contradictory statements and contradictory thoughts and stuff, which I think, uh, funny enough, I think this episode does have a couple of them too, which is great that we can address that and actually do it in a way that is productive and uh, challenges me as well to think about things a little bit differently. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious about, you know, these, uh, how, how these takeaways happen from these unfinished products, because, you know, we live in a society that is kind of based on outcomes, right? You, you get rewarded for the things you finish and you get rewarded based on your performance sometimes with it. And, you know, maybe, performance is measured not only by the effort you put in but how it impacts other people or how it changes things within society and so i, I kind of think about it too like when when you're in that kind of when you're doing this kind of work for instance for me i have a book that is maybe a quarter finished done and i haven't worked on it in quite some time but i have to say what I didn't realize when I was writing that book is that I, I became, I learned more about myself, the more effort I put in and I built more of this discipline. And I realized that my anxiety and this resistance I have towards this type, this type of work is very emotionally based and just recognizing that it's emotionally based really made me reflect on this, the other things that I kind of procrastinate on, let's say, or um, those tasks that I have this very difficult time starting and that I end up doing what I consider productive things that aren't related to it, like, you know, cleaning my room or trimming like my beard or like planning out something or writing uh, something else that's unrelated, all in a sense to avoid the main thing. And then I, I get excited too because there are so many other things that I that are left unfinished and especially like you mentioned to relationships that you can gain so many lessons from and I feel like 
how do we get from reframing that something has to be completed or has to be this certain outcome that you place that expectation you have how do you remove that and just focus on you know the moment this journey and what you take away from it gosh that's such a good question and i'm even thinking very much in my head in what i've done and, and i'm trying to figure out if there was a strategy behind it or in many ways automatically developed me because of just the fact that I needed to figure it out to get out of a bad place, right? Because sometimes when you need it to figure out, you don't care about what methods get you there. You're just going to do whatever it takes. And sometimes that subconsciously, I think, brings in a lot of the lessons. There is one thing that came to mind as you were asking that, which is uh, something that is very common in the agency industry. And as I'm even saying that, I'm, I'm kind of chuckling to myself thinking about how often I bring in career experience into life experience and life experience into career experience, because I really see that there is an opportunity to utilize strategies in both fronts that allows you to grow in both ways, professionally and personally. And there's something in our agency that after every project we complete, there's something that we do called the retrospective meeting. And the retrospective meeting involves every party that was involved on that project getting together and discussing what went well with the project, what could have been done better, and what to do next. And we it comes down into three statements, like, what do we start doing? What do we stop doing? What do we keep doing? And I think about how well that could play out if that was asked from a circumstance that you're going through in life, right? Like, let's use relationships because I, I kind of like the, where, where we're heading with this. It's like, imagine you come out of a relationship and you're like, okay, let me take a second to ask myself what to start doing, what to stop doing, and what to keep doing. First and foremost, the, the statement itself is making it about you. What do I stop doing? What do I start doing? What do I keep doing? So automatically you're stopping the blame component of that person was at fault because when you start doing that, you automatically take that responsibility off your shoulder, thus limiting the growth that you could have had if you took that responsibility on. So by asking that question, it does that right away. Secondly, for you to answer those three questions, you have to do some reflecting on the experience, right? How can you figure out what you should stop doing if you haven't thought about why that's worth putting down as an item to stop doing. So it makes you kind of go through the um, those dark areas that that we sometimes hear called shadow work, right? You're kind of going into those areas about yourself that maybe maybe it's difficult to think about. You know, for me, for a very long time, um, anger is something I've been battling with, and the anger component is something that I've had to, in many instances, stop and think about, like what to stop, what do I stop doing. You know, and the stop doing doesn't just say stop being angry because it's not that simple, right? It, you kind of go deeper. You start saying, what what makes me angry? Oh, stop, stop being impatient, right? Or like stop over, like stop speaking over the person. You know, what to start doing? Let the person speak first, right? Like you start thinking a bit more micro about the bigger issues. So it really starts getting clinical. And I, I get excited about that because I think there's a lot of opportunity to reflect and grow from it. I can tell you that I've really started doing it heavily in the last four years. And in the last four years, by doing it heavily, um, it resulted in why I published the book, because in many ways that played a role in my therapy, right? What do I start doing? One of the things that I remember specifically pointing out is that I needed to get it out of my system, the hurt, the pain, the, the anger, the frustrations. And that resulted in me putting out a book because when I started pouring it out of me, I resulted, I, re I realized that it's a common issue and there's a story that I can share that might be able to help each other. So beautiful things blossom when you spend time watering the right areas of your life. And I think it's worth thinking about it from that perspective. Um, I'm curious about this too. I mean, we talked about sm start and smell, uh, stop and smell the roses in many of our episodes. And that's something that comes up a lot, which is being intentional about reflecting back on things. Is there emotion that you've gone through? Because your personal development is very rapid. I've been able to witness a rapid growth. And as a matter of fact, I get to witness uh, while you're going through a challenge, right down to if you overcame it or if you're still struggling with it. So in many ways, I get like front row VIP meet and greet with Camille on all, on all fronts. But I'm curious on the back end, what is the processing that's happening through those things that makes you come out of it? Is it the conversations that make you go back and come to a conclusion? Or are you journaling? I'm very curious about how you tackle it down from your side. Yeah, you know what? It's crazy because like, 
I love the way that you phrased it, which is um, what should I stop doing, what do I keep doing, and what should I start doing? I think those are very powerful statements, and especially ones that, like, you can, I can hear you even say them. Like, they're so integral to who you are, I feel like. And it's funny because I kind of have a similar approach, but it's it's more focusing what I found helped and what actually propelled me, like, a lot more to improving myself is focusing on what I can control and and letting go of what I cannot and that's the phrasing I use and also when it goes from there then it's um then it goes uh because in my head and when I try to intellectualize it I end up using words like how do I prevent this how what can I do to stop this what can I do to stop uh, what can I do to start gaining more control? Why do I feel powerless? I What I try to do is I take those emotions I'm feeling in the moment and I attach a label to them. So, um, for instance, when I when I end a relationship or when it doesn't work out, I, I, I sit with how I'm feeling. And it's very hard to, for me to even sit still sometimes because I have like these intense emotions when when there's external things going around. And that's what I noticed with myself, that I am a sensitive person. So then I attach a label to all these emotions. So when a relationship ends, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of things attached. Obviously sadness, there's grief, there is relief, there is anxiety. There's all this different worry. There's this fear. Uh, there is this sense of helplessness and hopelessness and kind of uh, feeling feeling weak. So I've I already have like eleven different emotions that I that I even labeled now, and then I look at them very closely, and I determine which ones need the most attention right now. For instance, which ones, which of those emotions I feel the most intensely about. And then I try to determine if it's a primary meaning that like that's the emotion that just comes organically or if it came from another emotion. Like, for instance, the best example I use is hurt. Hurt is usually second, I mean, uh, anger. Anger is usually secondary to hurt or disappointment or uh, expectations, right? And when it's primary, because it can be primary, it can be a natural response, then it's something that you listen to and you use as a way to push forward and to fight that. So for me, I determine which emotion is the most intense. And then I figure out, for me, I really like going to the origins of it. However, I notice if I do go into origins and I focus on it too much and I lose track of time, then I have to start writing because what, what that happens is then I attach a story and then it becomes a lot bigger. And sometimes I can't get out of my own head to get out of my head. I usually write about what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling, or I talk about it with you, with a therapist even, or, um, with, with someone I'm comfortable with that usually tends to help because then me speaking out loud sometimes isn't is a lot better than me thinking silently and from there I I determine which other emotions are attached and then if this is a repeating pattern is this is the fact that this relationship ending is that is the other person somewhat responsible to blame but I do never, I never want to place blame on them. What happens is when I say that to myself, I say, for instance, like, um, I'll, I'll use just a silly example. Like I, um, let's say I, I texted a girl that I'm interested in and she doesn't text me back within, I don't know, let's say I'm, I'm feeling insecure that day and she doesn't text me back within 10 minutes and I start panicking. And then I ask myself, why like, what does she have to this? Like, does she owe me a, like, you know, a 10 minute, um, response. And I mean, you know, that's a silly thing to imagine, but at the same time too, when I place it that way, then it makes me think, 
oh my god, my expectations are way too high. Like, why? And then I can learn to manage that. So I really think about it in an emotional context, just in the sense that I, I guess I am hyper emotional. And then that way, I'm able to break it down. And the more and more aware I am of myself and the more and more aware I am of my emotions, I find the better I get at managing them. And the more I grow because I'm able to sit with them. And actually, the more I grow because when I talk about them, I can express them in a way that maybe is more relatable. Or people see me as vulnerable, but that's the thing, right? I'm being vulnerable and I'm not scared to. And in that way, it makes me feel stronger and it helps the other person actually feel more of a sense of a connection. So it's a weird thing that the stronger I get by expressing my emotions, the more connected I get to other people, even when they can't relate to them. And for some reason, it's, I, it's not that I don't care. It's just that I don't mind if people are uncomfortable with me oversharing. Because, you know, I have a tendency, according to some people, that I overshare, I overdo, and I overthink. And I find that hilarious because I disagree. I just think it's a misunderstanding, but I'm okay with being misunderstood. And because I have that in me, that being okay with people not understanding me and not expecting this external outcome and just focusing on my internal outcome, which is the one I want, which is the person I want to be and to improve myself, that leads me to these goals. It's interesting when you say overdoing, overthinking, right? And and over expressing and over sharing. It's like the word over immediately comes down to the fact that they're comparing you to something and usually it's themselves or what they see in the market. Uh, I really enjoy Tim Ferriss's uh, 40 hour, uh, four hour work week. Sorry, I have to get that book right because Tim Ferriss did a really good job on that one. And one of the things he expresses is the fact that by us doing those 40 hour weeks, we're actually training ourselves to dictate what's possible in those 40 hours, right? We're kind of seeing like, okay, this is my job for eight hours today. And you're not going to move any quicker because you're getting paid by the hour, not paid by the task. There is no benefit to better efficiencies. It's about just doing your time and getting it done. So when you leave, you kind of come back with, this is how much I think I can do a day. And the realization of uh, one thing that Tim Ferriss did a really good job outlining is the, the fact that you can do far more than the world tells you is just you haven't given yourself an opportunity to prove it. But the second you prove it, you never come back. You know, you'll always remember that it's possible to go faster. And that's something that I've taken very seriously. Like when I realize that I can do something faster, I don't let someone convince me that it's actually bad for me. Right. And I, I don't let someone convince me that it's unhealthy or that I'm going to burn out because my body is something that's saying the opposite. You know, my body is feeling up. It is thriving off it. It's getting excited about life because there's more being done. And to me, that gets really, really fun. And because of that, it's there, there's two elements to this that I'm a big fan of. One of them is that I don't need to slow down just because I think others are slowing are slow too. Like I don't think I should take my foot off the gas just because others are as well. But there's the other side of it that, you know, my girlfriend Priya was actually the one that brought this up to my attention because on a recent project that I was doing. I was starting to get frustrated with some of the people I was working with because I just couldn't get over the fact that they weren't moving as fast as I was. I couldn't get over the fact that I was doing like X amount of things and they were nowhere near, they, they were doing a fraction of that. And then Priya one day said, would you rather be doing this alone and get it done quickly, but doing all of the tasks? Or would you rather have it moving slowly, but others are doing the tasks with you? And that was a good reminder of checking myself which is that checking yourself comes with the empathy that you can't expect everyone to run at your speed, right? There's a popular saying out there that you can, you can move faster alone, but you can murder together. And that one actually really hit home because it was a realization that I can move fast, but even if I had to do every single tedious task fast, there's only so much I could do. Not to mention I'm not excited about those tasks, which means I'm going to lose excitement for the project on top of that. So there, there was a level of patience that grew in me which is actually okay with the fact that someone's not moving fast enough. Now, there's the other word that came to mind that we, we kind of teased a little bit, which was the word delegate. And I don't know if we talked about this enough, 
I'm curious from you, and then I, I'll share my delegation story because I do delegate some specific things. But if I, if I ask you to think about your day-to-day, Camille, are there things that maybe you haven't even thought about until now, but are there things that you delegate, no matter how big or small, in order to get things off your plate so that you can get more done every day and maximize your time? Funny enough, there are things that I can delegate, but I choose not to for the, for the reason of when I do them myself, I have, I combine them, I combine them with other tasks and they kind of help me achieve other goals. So for, I'll give you an example. I live with my parents. I can easily ask them to do groceries and I can give them a grocery list. But instead what I do is I take a bike to the grocery store and I bring a backpack. So that gives me a little bit of cardio and uh, and it allows me to leave the house when I need a break. So I, so I have, you know, the task of actually like, you know, doing an errand, I have the exercise and I have that break. So I can delegate that I choose not to same with uh, like cooking dinner. So I, I make food for the family, like uh, for my parents as well as myself, uh, mainly because I want to I want to improve my relationship with them. So I give them that. I also want to control what I eat because I tend to make food that isn't so high in calories and doesn't and is healthier, let's say, than what they might make or what they might want. And I'm not a tyrant. I don't just say you have to eat this and like, you know, I'm I'm good with that. But the whole point is to build a social aspect of it. Uh, the sense of gratitude for letting me stay here uh, and trying to express that, trying to rebuild these relationships that I've neglected for a while and try to set an example for them for nutrition, especially for the fact that they want to lose weight as well. So I want to show them that it's possible. And you know what? To their credit too, they have been following my advice and they have been losing weight. So it makes me happier. So those tasks, for instance, I could have my mom like make food but because i make it i get all these other benefits so i choose not to delegate it and with other tasks unfortunately since my current lifestyle right now is very solitary with the exception of maybe like um the research projects i work on uh the delegation's already implied and it's not up to me there are certain times where i can delegate like menial tasks and i do But my day-to-day life, not really. Okay, so there's there's some really interesting things here I want to dive into. Uh, First and foremost, maybe you're forgetting, and I want to challenge you to go a little bit deeper, because an example of us delegating is this podcast. Right. Right. Right? When we have an episode hammered out, you don't do every single part of this podcast show. You have things that you do and I have things that I do. And in many ways, by having that delegation in place, both of us kind of gets to lean on our strengths and make this happen like clockwork every single week without any any hesitation now. I feel like we've solidified a process. You know, as soon as this episode is done, you jump on the video side. I take the audio, throw it out onto the podcast platform so that the streamers can listen to it. I, take, I chop up some of the graphics and I put it up on social media. We talk about the episodes together. We come back with ideas of what to talk about next. There's a lot of delegation that are happening there. Um, So there's one example there. When I said that, did it make you think about other micro delegations that maybe you don't consider? You know, for example, do you wash your car or do you take it to a car wash? Like, do you have some, do you have people washing it when you take it to car wash? Like that's an example of micro delegations. I'm curious if something else comes to mind when you think about that. Huh? Interesting enough. Okay, so no, when it comes to the car stuff, not really. I I am really trying hard here. I I it seem like I can't. Hmm. Maybe um. Maybe with the physio stuff, that's why I got into physio because it's not it's not at any cost to me. I want to improve my body, and I do that, and it's covered by my. Uh, my benefits with the veterans affairs here, but I'm not sure if that necessarily counts. Uh, other micro tasks, I, I can't really think of any to be yeah, honest. Yeah, micro ones are hard to think, think about. Um, yeah, let me know if another one comes back to you because I, I also want to dive into that second part that you said, which is something that I'm extremely passionate about 
that I've made it my agenda to talk about more in uh, in many of my productivity talks going forward, which is the art of stacking. And what you highlighted here was very interesting, which is the, the ability to stack on things that are maybe energy drainers with energy boosters. So picture like Lego pieces and picture energy drainers have certain colors. Um, what, what came to mind? I'm, think, I'm thinking blue. What, what are you thinking of when you think of energy boosters? Oh, for me, yellow. Yeah, I mean, I also thought maybe green for go, but I mean, okay, yellow it is. You know that and excitement then, when the light is about to do it and you're, you're still going to make it? That's the way I see it. <laughs> Just here you go. And then picture your energy drainers as another color. Now, most people would stack the same colors together. You know, it just looks pretty, looks consistent. Why not? But what if that, that you stack one drainer with one booster at a time so you're able to get more done with the day, but also, the, you know, let's, let's take out the, the jargon of drainers and boosters and say, what if you stack on something you're excited about with something you're not excited about? An example that comes to mind right away for me is um, the, the daily cardio that I tried to get in, you know, that seven kilometer walk that I try to do. I am not excited about that. I got to tell you that every single time I know I got to get out there, it's very difficult to get excited about the fact that I'm tying my laces to go out in the heat and just walk a full lap and come back. But what gets me excited is the fact that I only allow myself to listen to these audiobooks that I'm obsessed with or these podcast shows that I'm obsessed with only when I'm walking. And I got to tell you, the more I get into an audiobook and the more I get into a podcast episode, I get really excited the next time to tie my laces, knowing that I'm going to get to get into it. And what happens as a byproduct is that while I'm working on my physical health, by listening to these audiobooks, because I'm very deep on personal development books, I'm also working on my mental health. I'm working on my personal development as well in both areas, both physical and mental, and bringing in some educational pieces. You know, you and I reference books all the time. And that's no accident. And a lot of those come out of the fact that I'm doing those seven kilometer walks on a regular basis. So there's a beautiful example of stacking. You know, you spending time cooking, although the physical activity of cooking, I know some people say it's therapeutic. I don't imagine that may be the case for you, but you, I love how you said it. It gives you that opportunity to build a relationship and, and, and some um, like fortify this relationship a bit more, eat healthy, see them become healthy, and so many other benefits that come out of it that it's almost like when you're cooking, if your mind is on that, you're not really worried about the fact that you got to find the pan and slap on butter or whatever else you need to do to get that thing going. Um, I think that it gets really exciting when you think about the ability to stack. Because the reality is when people think about their 24 hours, you know, to, to discredit the, the toggle app for a second here, unfortunately, when you're tracking, you're tracking one, one item at a time, right? You're tracking wellness, not the fact that maybe you were walking with someone else and also building a relationship with them, right? So you're not tracking relationship, you're tracking wellness. Sometimes our mind thinks that way where the, these blocks that we talked about are in isolation, that you're only doing one block an hour or one block at a time. But why can't you put a block on top of that and stack something and get it done at the same time? And I think that's very much possible in today's world. You know, the walking and, and audiobooks is one example of that. You know, you and I doing these podcast episodes is another example of that. You know, we're learning from each other. We're, we're creating great episodes that the world can listen to. We're recording videos that we can use later for marketing or to give people visuals if they would like to. We're getting a lot done at the same time. And I think it's very important. And my hopes from people thinking about the art of stacking, and I call it art of stacking. I don't know if you can find that if you Google it. You might find some weird Lego website <laughs> that teaches you how to stack pieces together. But what I hope is that by simply having this paradigm shift, you're starting to think about the world in not just 24 hours being a year, but rather many, many opportunities to bring in multiple levels of growth that you can have. Um, I really want to illustrate this as we wrap up this episode, Camille. When you think about stacking, we might even need to do a full episode on this because, oh, gosh, yeah. I'm excited about this. And I'm trying to better define it one episode at a time because even in my head, I'm trying to figure out the best way to articulate it. What are some examples aside from the ones that you gave? So you talked about cooking relationship. Um, you talked about, sorry, help me out with the other one. Cause it was oh, a stacking. Yeah, uh, doing groceries, but biking there. Yes. Yes. That's the one that immediately made me think about stacking, right? Getting the task done, but getting your cardio in and as well, giving yourself a break, beautiful levels of stacking. What are some other examples of stacking that either you do or you see someone else do? Because I want to give some concrete examples that 
maybe one listener will say, oh, I could tackle these two as well together. And hopefully that comes out of this. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, when I'm making myself breakfast in the morning and I need to wait, a lot of people will say, we'll relate that to waiting for the kettle to boil the water. Stretch. That's another thing. So you feel better, you know, especially first thing in the morning when you're already tight from, you know, sleeping in one position for eight hours, hopefully, then you loosen up a bit as well. And, you know, then that has many other benefits. I have, um, I use, I, I bought this thing that is used mainly for seasonal affective disorder. It's blue. It's a, it's a UV light simulator or whatever you want to call it. And I have that shining in the ba in my peripheral while I'm on the computer studying. And what that does is it promotes uh, me to wake up and it helps with my hormones. So I consider that like a health biohack stack onto what I'm doing, which is the studying. Uh, when it comes to exercise as well, uh, I fit in the stretches when I can. Those stretches not related to the activity I'm doing. Um, I, I guess other examples would be, you know, the, the most easiest one is if you and your partner want to get healthier, do things actively together, right? You can explore together. You can take walks together. You know, you're spending quality time with that person and still doing a physical task. Um, I, I'm hard pressed to come up with other examples that I hear people talking about because mainly I don't think people think about, you know, what you describe as stacking, which is yes. an amazing idea. Not a lot of people think about it in, in those terms. And it's very hard for people to explain it in that way. Your example of going on a walk or hiking with your with your partner is such a good explanation and, and an illustration for how often we're probably stacking without realizing it. But we don't see it as a stack because we have um, our focus on what was the objective. And that that becomes kind of the thing that you got done. But you can have other benefits at the same time. You know, one example for me is like when I'm doing a long drive, you know, so sometimes I'm having those hour long drives multiple times a week. You know, what's stopping me from just calling someone on Bluetooth and having a conversation on my drive home? Right. And if you think about it, there's that aspect of building a relationship with someone. You know, we talk a lot about how um, people get too busy and, and sometimes busyness becomes excuse for why they don't stay in touch and they lose connections with other people. And sometimes that kind of creates a, a barrier to building relationships. It's like, why couldn't you call someone using Bluetooth safely? You know, I have to emphasize safely so I don't get in trouble here while you're driving to make sure that you can have a better relationship with someone. You know, you can even have a full on meeting with someone to handle a business idea or a solution or execution to get it done as well. Um, I mentioned that I do some delegation as well. I, I actually have just recently brought on a virtual assistant and she helps me with many areas of different things that I'm doing because I've become a really big fan on the, the Eisenhower concept that we just talked about, which is I decided to offset some of these tasks that I could do that, to be honest, anyone with minimum training could do. It's just, it needs to get done for me to be able to achieve the things I want to achieve. So I've recently brought a virtual assistant and she's been helping me with a lot of things as well. And that is another idea, area of stacking where she's stacking with me. You know, it's, it's, it's that collaborative component. And that's another example of daily stacking that happens all the time is when you're working with someone on something, you know, you and I are working on this podcast. It's like that's stacking together on just building an episode together. You know, your content, my content, your content, my content at the very end, the value that we provide is this giant like Jenga sized stack that we're giving to people because you and I kept building it together. Not it's not one person show in on in any way. So I get really excited about that. And I'm going to put some thought behind this because I think somewhere in this season, we're going to have an episode called better stacking. And what I want to do in preparation for that, and I, I'd love for you to even uh, be on board with this if interested is Take some time to create a list of all the things that we recognize that we've done. We've, we've been better at stacking. I think by us just setting that agenda is going to make us more aware when we do it. And I, I want to somewhere down the road, come back and actually just outline a bunch of ways we stack, because I think I really believe that in every area of anything I've ever done that I consider to be successful involved high levels of stacking. And it's not always even the consistent stacking is different areas and different items being taken off. You know, I, I talk about delegation. I also want to bring up that when I did my book, you know, I, I mentioned earlier this episode, like I didn't know how to print. I didn't know the formatting. 
I also need to point out that I didn't figure out the answer. I just got someone else to do it for me. You know, I found someone that was an expert in publishing and I had them take that on and, and run with it. I had someone that's an expert in formatting and proofreading. Um, you know, I need to reconsider it after those couple of errors that they didn't catch as a proofreader, but they did the proofreading for me. This journal that I'm releasing, exact same concept. You know, we, I have a vision. Um, you know, Priya, my girlfriend and I, we talked about how to bring this vision to life. But now we passed it on to other experts to design it, to print it, to ship it, to set up distribution and give us everything that we need. Guys, there is unlimited abilities to get yourself out there and bet on your strengths and allow other people to take over those weaknesses and stack with you. And I'm really excited to potentially get into that in a future episode, Camille. But man, I got to tell you, I'm incredibly happy with how this episode went, because when we started off, I know we want to talk about efficiencies, but... Man, I did not know about the roller coaster of things we talk about, and I could not be happier. And I really hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, Camille. And more importantly, I hope the viewers got more value than anything else. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm also very shocked at how uh, how this turned out, and I'm very happy for it too. Especially the fact that it's it's amazing that you were talking to me like yesterday about this concept of stacking, and I didn't even realize that what I was doing was that and I we just had this conversation so it's an amazing what uh what comes out of these and I like maybe I I'm gonna try my best to summarize at least what I think we talked about in relation to increasing in, uh, efficiency like to have better efficiency uh, we described that you know stop comparing uh, yourself with the expectations of others to focus on what you can control uh, and preventing burnout and focusing on being diligent to complete the hard tasks first and to build the momentum and through that with task lists if possible uh, and stacking is another huge one which i'm excited to talk to you about in the future and so we can share because i think that is going to save a lot of time as well and of course delegation so well put, man. I, I think what you just said right there is going to be the description of this episode and what it's about because, gosh, I could not have done it if you asked me to summarize everything we talked about because it, it, it was a beautiful whirlwind that actually came together as a masterpiece, which sometimes is the, the best thing about this podcast show. Camille, as always, it is a pleasure. You always bring your A-game. I said that at the beginning, and once again, you delivered, and I'm very grateful to be able to um, be a, a co-pilot with you in this incredible show that we're launching. And to the listeners, as always, we, we greatly appreciate you listening, even if it's for a minute. If you even got one piece of value from this entire episode, uh, please do share and let us know because we'd love to share it with other viewers and we'd love to continue diving in deeper to those areas. Camille, thanks again for joining in. I, I look forward to coming back next week and keeping it active. And we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Me too.